I mean to speak in the name of the Father and of the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Well, it's lovely to be with you, albeit from surprisingly sunny London at the moment, and not in the searing heat of St. Bart's. It is the last Sunday of the season in St. Bart's, and everybody goes away for a well-earned holiday and a rest. Uh, and um, we pray for no hurricanes and for calm and peaceful weather. And we much look forward to seeing you all again in late October, when I will be back on the island. Today, we hear the gospel uh, reading, which, in which we hear Peter's great confession that Jesus he sees as the Christ of God, of the anointed one of God, of the son of God. And Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I think I am? There was a sense that they were groping for the answer. They were talking about Elijah. They were talking about Jeremiah. They were talking about all sorts of other prophets. They were groping their way to identify precisely who they really believed that Jesus was. They could feel it. They could sense something, but they actually couldn't put their finger on it, or they couldn't make that declaration, that commitment, that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Peter stepped out, and that's a word that actually is worth looking at a bit later on, but he stepped out in faith, and he said, yes, Lord, you are the Messiah, you are the Anointed One, you are the Son of God. That was an extraordinarily brave thing to do because he couldn't know, but he sensed it, and he sensed it strongly enough to actually make that statement. Who do you say I am? Who do we say that Jesus is? What is Jesus to us? How is Jesus to us? A great friend of mine a few days ago said to me, Charlie, when you're talking to people and you want to try and communicate your faith, the reason for your faith, the faith in what, and the person you're explaining it to really has no relationship with the divine or doesn't perceive one, of course they do in reality, but doesn't perceive that they actually have that relationship. How do you, how do you lead that person into that relationship and into that reality and power and peace and love of God. Because in reality, that's the most important thing. Without that, there really is nothing. <clears throat> and when he was talking to me, he said to me, well, of course, most people look at the church as an interesting structure. It's a cultural thing. It's all about rules and regulations and dogma and theology, sort of, if you like, spiritual gymnastics and mathematical equations, but not relational and that seems to me to be absolute nub of it and that's one of the things that the charismatic church over the last 40 to 50 years has really done so powerfully for spirituality for christianity and that is to open up the experience of the divine and certainly that was true in my life i mean i'd always been a cultural christian and it wasn't until and i loved singing in the choir at school and i've been all my life my father was um, very much a, a believer and a church uh, and but, but it was cultural more than it was anything else. And of course, a lot of people who weren't, aren't brought up in that culture wouldn't have had that same grinding, that same experience. What the charismatic church did is that they opened up this whole area of experiencing God, experiencing the divine by the Holy Spirit. And as I've said, um, here many times before it's a physical reality you can feel it you can actually feel that presence of god and so first of all my explanation would be about building relationship opening oneself up to the power of the holy spirit now that can come through worship it can come through circumstance it can come through crisis where one is forced to communicate with the divine for help. And so many prayers that I've heard for people who are suffering in some way, which, which are very simple. They're simply, help, Lord, if you're there, please help. 
And that opens up the channels for communication. It opens up being able to receive and to communicate to God. And that is an extraordinary, powerful thing. The second thing is that, that we meet God, yes, in the circumstances of our life, but we meet God also through other people. And one of my constant prayers is, may those who I meet find God in me, and may I find God in them. Speaking, being in relation, communicating, being community, that again is another experience of God. Scripture, of course, is a huge, huge reservoir for us to understand a little bit more about God. In, in reality, it is a roadmap. And as Trinette Wellesley Wesley said to me years and years ago, she said, Scripture is really the story of everybody's life. We have our Genesis moments. We have our Psalm moments. And the Psalms are just a fantastic resource. This is not some holy Joe. This is really down and, and, and real living. Uh, that's why it's so extraordinary. You can shout and scream at God and you can thank God. You can praise God. You can you can unload all your anxieties and stress to God. And it's a very interesting thing. When I do my quiet time in the morning, which is a sort of mixture of prayer and reflection and meditation and reading, it's, it's an extraordinary reality for me is that if I wake up worrying about something, which usually I am, I then do my, my time of quiet. And by the end of it, it's gone. That worry has gone. A peace, that peace that passes all understanding, the peace that only Jesus can give us, it does seep into one's very center, into one's core being, if you like, and enables them to one to do the day. So communication, which is receiving, reading, it is about communicating, speaking, laying before God one's concerns and anxieties, also lifting to God all of those who we're going to come across during the day, and our families and our friends. And the other weird reality is I find that when I pray for other people, even though they have no idea I'm praying for them, when I see them again, I feel as though I've developed a deeper relationship. with them. It's very strange, but it is a reality. You pray for healing for people. You pray for difficult circumstances and decisions to be, to be dealt with. And like all of us, there are so many different things in life that we have to try and do or we, we feel that we have to achieve, and we worry about them. And there was that wonderful saying, and I can't remember who said it now, but you know, I've been worrying all of my life. And the weird thing is now that I get older, I find out that all the things I was worrying about, most of them never happened. And there is that sense that the divine is with us at all times, is there to heal, to lead, to show us the way. That's principally what Christ did on the cross. He died on the cross and he said, it is finished. It is done. And then the resurrected Christ on Easter Day, the day rises again. And that isn't just demonstrating what will happen through our physical death, but during our life. There are always times of little crucifixions, but necessarily and always there is resurrection after those crucifixions. So really my explanation to people is to come and search and feel and taste that God is good, that God is light and life and love and peace. And just to finish, I'm doing a wedding this afternoon, and we're recording this on, on Friday. Uh, and this particular wedding, there were difficult family circumstances and difficult relationships. And I did the rehearsal yesterday and was talking precisely about this, about the Holy Spirit and about healing and the reality of God's presence. And it was extraordinary. It was like the glacier melted. There were smiles, there were tears, there was reconciliation. And that's, that's the wonderful power of God. That's the God we should be excited about and worship 
and be present with. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.